One shot, screenshot that uh, welcomes everybody and thanks everybody for joining us today uh, for worship services at the Sunrise Church of Christ. And if anything uh, is said or done that uh, you have questions about, feel free to ask any of our members. Uh, just about everyone here should be able to answer about any question you have. Uh, if they don't know the answer right away, they know where to find it. It's, uh, it's in the Bible. Uh, what is it? Uh, First Peter, the Second Peter, chapter one says that all things that pertain to life and godliness are given to us through the knowledge of God and, the, and His Son Jesus Christ. So we welcome you all. Thank you. And uh, if you're visiting with us today, you are our honored guest, and uh, we'd like a, like to exchange uh, or extend a uh, cordial invitation for uh, for you to visit again anytime you have an opportunity. Um, so as I said, we have a whole bunch of uh, announcements this morning. Helen McIntyre is still in Ruby Hospital in Morgantown. Her daughter Kim is staying with her. Helen has been diagnosed with Hobbs paralysis and uh, they're treating her with uh, seizure medicine. Uh, Wes McIntyre is now at Ellison Assisted Living and Memory Care in Marietta, room D11. 150 uh, Browns Road. Uh, well, oh, I'm sorry, room D11. The address is 150 Browns Road, Marietta, Ohio. Visits are appreciated. Uh, please pray for Susan Clark. She is in Belfry Landing, recovering from heart trouble. Uh, please pray for the family of Tracy Allen at his untimely death. He was a very dear friend of uh, Mike and, and Danny Carpenter's. So keep that uh, family uh, in your prayers, please. Uh, Nancy Van Meter was sent home from the hospital last Tuesday. Uh, however, her red blood cell numbers are still low. So uh, still in need of prayer. Judy, Ruth Leonard's daughter, is now home from the hospital. The family is very grateful for all your thoughts and prayers. Chris Taylor uh, was laid to rest last Friday morning. Please keep the family in your prayers at this time. Um, Donnie Hendershot is still a little weak uh, as he recovers. Uh, Charlotte Eckert is recovering from her surgery uh, she had last Tuesday. Her uh, daughters are home helping her. Cards and prayers are appreciated. Jennifer Parsons had a procedure and has had several stitches in her back and shoulder. Helen May Hubert is in Cedar Grove and has not been feeling well. Um, is there an update? I uh, remember hearing that there was a COVID outbreak there. It wasn't very wide, widespread, but there were a few people that were affected. Nobody knows them. Oh my, I guess Helen May uh, fell and broke her hip and then got COVID on top of that. So she, uh, um, Joyce said that she used to be a, a member here when Joyce was younger. Uh, Karen Metz is still weak and uh, not feeling 100%. Uh, I don't see her She's not today. good. She's working. Uh, Karen, my wife, um, 
has not been feeling well. She um, has had a respiratory infection. Uh, this one medication she's taken, it, it makes her prone to that and, and makes it hard to get over. She's had a nagging cough for, for weeks now, but uh, she wasn't here last Wednesday because she was really feeling bad. As you can see, she's here today and feeling a little bit better, but uh, this, this uh, upper respiratory infection is still uh, plaguing her. So, uh, prayers for Gabe and Allie, uh, they are traveling. Mark Parsons, uh, his family is uh, homesick and may have COVID, they're, they're not sure. And then Patty Vaughn, uh, she uh, was tested positive for COVID. Uh, so keep her in your prayers. Uh, Doug and Connie would like to thank everyone for the um, anniversary cards. Uh, they were celebrating their 90th wedding anniversary, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with her today is uh, her 100 year old son <laughs> that's what I thought that's a dad joke <laughs> and uh, we have many shut-ins on our list Evelyn Duckworth, Carol Johnson Ruth Ann Lemon Kathy Simmons, Doug Stevens Charlotte Eckhart or Ronnie but he's here today uh, he must be doing a little bit better and Wes and Helen and Bill Spear. So keep these phone, uh, folks in your prayers, if you will. Uh, also, uh, December the 10th, uh, we're planning on uh, putting uh, baskets together and delivering them. And uh, so uh, if anyone wants to donate some cookies or, or different items to put in there, uh, they're also uh, looking for cash donations to purchase fruit. Uh, so if you're interested uh, in uh, helping with that uh, work, you could uh, see Elvis or, or one of the elders uh, sometime. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Anything I missed? Okay. I don't see any upcoming events. Uh, we have uh, <coughs> birthdays. Uh, Liam Oates, uh, how old would he be? Five? Nine. Nine. Nine uh, on the uh, 24th. And uh, so that's all for birthdays and anniversaries. So uh, Mike is going to be leading our singing this morning. So let's join in and sing praises to the Lord. <clears throat> Page 32. <clears throat> Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loss of my loved angel. I need Thy strength to lead myself. 
this morning will be from Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your, moder let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which, path, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. <coughs> Let's pray together. Holy Father, we come before you, Father. Thanksgiving and praise, recognizing you, Father, as the, the only true living God, creator of heaven and earth and seas and all that is in them. Father, we're so thankful that, that you are our God and that you have uh, sought us, Father, called us, that you have made a way for us to be forgiven of our sins and reconciled unto you through the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your word that gives us comfort and guides us. Uh, Father, we're reminded of Paul's words in, in uh, Romans that uh, the things that were written before time were written for our, our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope, Father. We, we understand that the Bible, Father, is, is a historical record of of your interaction with man now through the millennia. Father, we recognize your goodness and forbearance even when we, when we don't deserve it, Father. We just thank you and praise you. Pray, Father, for all those of your household that you would bless and guide each one. Help us to be better disciples, profitable servants, to bring glory and honor to you, Father, and to Preach the gospel of peace and reconciliation to all those around us. Father, we pray your blessings and mercy and grace be great towards all men everywhere, especially those in seats of authority, Father. And when we have to turn on the news to, to hear of all the trouble in the world, Father, natural calamities and wars, and, but we know, Father, that you are in control of all things. Just uh, pray that you continue to uh, bless us, Father. Uh, be mindful of our weaknesses. Uh, be with us, Father, throughout the remainder of this worship, that everything that is said and done will be in accordance with your will. All these things, Father, we ask through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Page 337. <clears throat> Love in the Baby, a rose with the 
Well, this still, uh, this being the first day of the week, we have a, another opportunity to surround this table and to take these emblems, the unleavened bread that represents the body of Jesus that hung on the cross and uh, the fruit of the vine that represents his uh, blood that was shed to wash away the sins of the world. Uh, we, the night that, uh, that Jesus was betrayed, the night before his crucifixion, he instituted this um, memorial feast and instructed his disciples that as often as they partook of these emblems to do so in remembrance of him. Uh, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that sin separates us from God. But uh, God in his infinite wisdom and mercy and great love for us uh, made a way for us to be reconciled unto him. Jesus died on that cross. He, he bore the sins of all mankind and uh, his, shed was, uh, his blood was shed so that any that believe in him and uh, are willing to confess him and obey him and follow him uh, can be forgiven of their sins and his blood washes uh, those sins away. So let us keep these things in, in mind now as we give thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for loving us, Father, for providing this sacrificial sacrifice that uh, we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might uh, be reconciled to you, that we might have the hope, Father, of living forever with you in heaven. I ask, Father, to bless each one of us now as we partake of this uh, bread that represents the body of your Son. It's in his holy and precious name we pray. Let us continue our thanks. Father, we thank you for this uh, uh, fruit of the vine that represents the blood of your son that was shed, Father, to wash away the sins of the world. We pray that you bless each of us now as we partake of this. And may we do so in a manner as pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. And that concludes this portion of the worship service. We are also commanded to uh, lay by and store as uh, we have been prospered on the first day of the week. And if you've not done so already and wish to, there's a basket on the table as you exit the auditorium for your convenience. Thank you. Seventy two. Four seventy two. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray, although holy through, there's a silver light that shines in the heavenly land. Be happy, press on. Oh. 
morning. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. Certainly really glad to have you with us. We have a few visitors today. Angie has brought some family, and so certainly make sure you take some time to meet them. And I, I would uh, want to let you know that I have a friend here today. Actually, I did not invite him, but he came on his own. Isn't that good when they come on their own? Uh, a friend that started, I think it was in fifth grade, we started together, and we went and graduated together. And uh, at school, the school is actually no longer open anymore, but um, he's out this way hunting. So Darren, if you take a moment to meet my friend uh, Darren. I've known him forever. If you want to hear stories about me when I was younger, and I'm sure Darren can fill those in for you because he probably knows a lot of them. And, and in turn, I can spend the rest of our time telling stories about him. But, you know, I'm not going to do that this morning. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to, to go to Philippians chapter 4 this morning. And we're going to be looking at a, a few things from one of my favorite sections. You know, <laughs> Someone usually doesn't have to tell me twice to be happy because that's my nature. I would rather be happy than sad. I'd probably pretty much rather be happy than, than, than any other thing. But here the Apostle Paul, and it's kind of interesting that, that someone would have to tell Christians to be happy, isn't it? You think if anyone, and I've said this many times, if anyone would, would have... A, be happy in this world it would be Christians because they know in the next world they're going to heaven so you would think that Christians would, you, you would just look at a Christian and they, their, their cup would be full and they would be just overflowing with, with joy but it's not always like that and, and I think the Apostle Paul understood it wasn't like that and, and so he says rejoice in the Lord always and so Paul presents a rapid fire, if you will, of commands which are applicable to the whole congregation. And these imperatives, he starts with these, including rejoice. And of course he says rejoice, and again I say rejoice. And this is one of the only ones that he says twice, because he wants you to understand it, he wants you to get that. Uh, one word, rejoice, and then he fires off some more. In verse 5, he says, let your gentle spirit be known to all. Isn't that interesting? Gentle spirit. Does that describe us? Gentle spirit? Or, or if someone looked at you and say, well, that's a hostile spirit. I, I Hopefully, gentle spirit would, would describe you. And then he says in verse 6, be anxious for Nothing. We'll look at that in just a few minutes. In verse 6, he also says, let your request be made known to God. And then in verse 8, he says, dwell on these things. And verse 9, and practice these things, which we'll look at verse 8 and 9, Lord willing, next week. But the apostle is instructing the believers to show how to cope with their adversaries during turbulent times. And so this morning, we're just really going to look at at, at two different things. If I get this going the right way, I keep on hitting the wrong button. There we go. First, rejoice in the Lord always. And, and the verse is, is pretty simple. And it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Then he says, let your reasonableness be known or your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. So here's an attitude for a Christian. Okay, Paul, uh, I, now that I'm a Christian, how do you want me to be? How do you want me to act? What do you want me to do? Well, be happy. Well, what do you mean? It's, that sounds like, you know, uh, nah, there's certainly some other things I need to do. Well, you, here's where you start. You're happy. Well, why? Because an unhappy person is not attractive. Have you ever seen someone that's a, just a, a grouchy they have a name for that. I'm not going to say the name for that because we have people here by that name. Karen? <laughs> you know. But they, you know, I didn't give it, you know, the world kind of has a name for that. You know, kind of grouchy person. And, and we kind of want to say, okay, I'm going to avoid that person because they're just not happy. So a Christian is to be attractive to others, to attract them to the gospel. And so certainly that would be something that, that, that the Lord wants to be happy. 
And then let your reasonless, let your gentleness be, just gentleness be made known to everyone. So Paul admonishes the whole Philippian church to, to rejoice in Jesus Christ. And the call to rejoice is a apostle's command rather than a personal opinion. Many times we say, well, you know, these are opinions or, or, or it's my position to not be happy. And, but this is a command. We look at different commands through the Bible, and, and sometimes we realize our commands, sometimes we don't, but this is actually a command that we're to rejoice. And, and joy is an important theme throughout, that is threaded throughout the whole letter. Now, this is interesting because where's Paul when he writes this letter? He's in jail. And so, you know, how if we were in jail, would we be joyful? Well, maybe not, probably not. We'd say, how do I get out of the situation? You know, what can I do next? And, and I have all these problems because I'm in jail. And, and the phrase, in the Lord, bases the believer's rejoicing on the relationship with Jesus. It's not that he's in jail, it's he's looking at the more important picture, his relationship with Jesus. That's the important picture, isn't it? Not the situation we may be in at the time. And because of the Lord, the, the Philippians had their names written on the citizenship roll of heaven or in the book of life. And they possessed great cause for rejoicing in the hope of Christ's return. Luke chapter 10 and verse 20 says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, if everything from, the, from now on to the rest of my life goes bad, I could honestly say, honestly say, well, that's probably okay. It's not what I want. It's not what anybody wants. But when we get to that point where our names are written in the book of life, when our names are written in heaven, that's the good thing. So Paul challenges them to find their comfort and their inner peace in Jesus from day to day. How important is inner peace? And if I had to ask you one question this morning, do you have inner peace? What would your answer be? Or do you have <coughs> stress and conflict and all these things that, that the world pretty much piles on top of us many times without us even noticing sometimes? See, Paul's encouraging this peace. I think back to what I call some of the good old days, and I've mentioned this before, I never understood when I went south to my cousin's house in Tennessee. They lived on the South Fulton, Tennessee, Kentucky border, the, the cities in both states, and I never understood because they would, you know, because my life was this, 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 you had to be here, then you had to go here, then you had to run here, and, and, and everything had to be done in a certain amount of time, and we went there, and, and they said, okay, let's eat dinner, we ate dinner, and they said, what are we going to do now? What's next on the list? We have to do something, there has to be something on the list, we have to, we have to be some, no, you go in that chair, you sit. What do you mean? There's five chairs out there, six chairs, whatever, you go sit, kids might, the kids might play kick the cat, I was a kid at the time, and so they get an old, can or something, and they kick the can, and then eventually, when they had plastic milk jugs, it turned into that. Get the milk jug. And the older people, sometimes the kids would just sit there and, and, and just kind of sometimes just be quiet. Sometimes a car would come by and play with the car. That was exciting. You know, that's, but here, Paul is saying, take those things out, put that inner peace in, and the joy of the Lord would serve as our strength and the Philippian strength. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, then he said to them, Nehemiah said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet wine, and, and it's in portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Adver always emphasizes the continued rejoicing in which the Philippians are to engage. Notice it doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when things are going right. 
Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Rejoice in the Lord Sunday mornings from 10.30 to 11.30. Rejoice in the Lord, you know, just these one time, you know. We rejoice when everything is perfect. No, rejoice in the Lord always. And, and so, you know, we look at the same verse that Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. It simply says, it's, it's the shortest verse, by the way, in the English Bible, not in the Greek, but in the English it says rejoice always. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Two words, rejoice always. Such rejoice is not dependent on our circumstances. Matthew chapter 5, and verses 10 through 12. Jesus says, Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and other all kinds of utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But we wouldn't look at that and say, well, I, I want to go through hard times. I want to go through difficult times and, and, and Jesus, you're blessed. That, that's a good thing that that happens. It's like Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10. Also as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet always making many rich, is having nothing, yet possessing everything. O'Brien, a commentator, suggests that this paraphrase, keep on rejoicing in the Lord at all times, regardless of what may come upon you. Isn't that interesting? Keep up, no matter what's coming upon you, just keep on rejoicing. And that's really, it seems to be what Paul is, is saying here, just keep on rejoicing no matter what comes upon you. And it should be remembered, of course, that he's under house arrest in Rome and, and was considered in chains. Paul emphasized the importance of the uh, administration by using the repetition, again, I say rejoice. Rejoicing is an antidote to fear while living in a hostile world. So a person who rejoices, the adversary focuses on the blessings of life. Certainly, we're on Thanksgiving week, and so we need to focus on the blessings of life. So part of that is rejoicing, isn't it? Well, secondly and finally, this is the hardest part. And if we can get to the point where we're happy, if we can get to the point where we're rejoicing as Christians, be anxious for nothing. Now, this word anxious is the same word that we use for anxiety. It's the same word we use for worry. And we can, you know, probably connect several other words with that. And it's been said that there's been more anxiety. You know, we talk about, you know, I remember when COVID-19 first came out. First day, day one. They said it's going to last just a short time, a couple weeks. Remember that? And then before you know it, everything was shut down. Stay in your house. Don't go, don't go out of your house and trim your bushes. Don't do anything. And we didn't know how it was going to affect the world, but it affected all different aspects of the world. And one thing it certainly affected, and this is worldwide, is the church. It affected the church. The only person that had a victory with COVID was Satan. Because it affected the church. But here we see, be anxious for nothing, don't worry. But what they say is, what has happened, especially young people and older people, is since COVID-19, anxiety has gone up all kinds of levels. If, if you were anxious in 2018, you're five times as anxious now. Isn't that weird? If you worry back then, you worry twice as much now or three times as much now. And, and, and you might be sitting here this morning and say, I didn't worry then, I don't worry now. Well, good. That's good. Because Paul's command, here's another command, be anxious for nothing, or we can put this in our language, don't worry about anything. Well, I have to. If I don't worry about things, things won't get done. That's kind of our mindset, isn't it? Because the world... If I wasn't here, then the world wouldn't go around. Isn't that our mindset? Things wouldn't, the world wouldn't, well, 
it was here before you, it would be here after you. It was here before me, it would be here after me. Lest the Lord should decide to come during that time. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, that your request be made known to God. So here's the pattern. I've got something that I might consider my subject matter that I'm worried about or anxious about or concerned about. What do I do about that? Now, many times we sit there and we stress over it. Paul says, don't do that. Just take it. Give it to who? God. And let it go. But if God needs my help. No, God doesn't need your help. He didn't need your help to make the world. He doesn't need your help to take care of some, you know, the problems in the world. And that's really the message that Paul has here. Now, once again, if we begin to worry, and if we begin to get anxious, and we all are, are a little bit guilty of this, right? You know, if I say, have you worried about something? Raise your hand. I don't want you to do this, but if I ask this question, raise your hand if you've worried about something this, this last week. I bet every person in here, if they're honest, would say, yes, we worried about something last week. Yes, we worried about something the week before. Yes, we worried about something every week for the last, how, you know, how many weeks? If we're honest. Now, Paul says, here's the thing. The only person that gets glory from your worry is Satan. Because it interferes with not only your life, but your spiritual life. It interferes with that relationship. It interferes with your dependence on God and Jesus Christ. And so when I become worried about things and anxious and, and all those things, I'm saying, God, you can't handle this. Christ, you can't handle this at all because you need me to handle it for you. And guess what? I can't handle it. By worrying about it, it doesn't get anything done. All it does is make me a worse person make the situation a worse situation. And then he throws this word in there in verse 7. Peace. Remember that peace? I think it was in the 70s that we used to do that all the time. We had a little peace sign. You know, it might be seen somewhere, you know, hey, peace, brother. You know, don't do that as much anymore. Maybe... Some people do, I don't know, I don't see that very much anymore, but peace means it's inside me. I have the peace. In other words, I stay kind of relaxed, don't I? The Word of God, if I give God everything, if if I give it to Jesus and Jesus takes care of it, then I don't have to worry. I don't. I just have that peace in knowing that I trust in God. And God will take care of me. Look at the Apostle Paul. He finds himself in a Roman prison under house arrest. He's been there for a, a while. He spent, by this time, he spent some time in, in prison and, 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 and you know, not the idea situation, not the worst in the world, but not the idea situation, and he still finds peace. In other situations, you look at, at some of the apostles when they, they get arrested and put in prison, what do they do? They sing songs. They sing songs. I've never been to prison, and I hope to not go to prison, but I'm going to have to think about that if I ever get in that situation. What do I do when I'm here? I'm going to sing songs, I guess. Sing church songs. There you go. I don't recommend you ever go to prison or jail or anything like that, but if you do, guess what? Sing some songs. Why? Why would I rather sit there in a corner and because I don't need to worry about it. That's why. I, if I've done something bad, I probably should have been there. But Paul's there for preaching the gospel. And if I'm there for that reason, then that's okay. God's going to take care of me. I have to have the peace of God. 
which surpasses all understanding. In other words, you know, there's, there's people in the world that just can't understand that, but God understands. God understands what I go through. God understands my needs. And he will guard my heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So beyond rejoicing and possessing a gentle spirit, Paul urges the Philippians to have a peace in their lives. And the idea of worrying the believers should trust in God to watch over their lives and by using a negative command, be anxious for nothing. Paul warns the Philippians against being worried about the problems of life. And being anxious is an imperative of a term for which can be used possibly, positively or negatively. And the negative meaning is be anxious or be unduly concerned. And duly concerned, and the term appeals to several times in Jesus. Jesus many times talks about this in Matthew chapter 6, and verse 25, in the Sermon on the Mount, several of these, the next four are from the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat, what you drink, about your body, what you put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Couple verses down in chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Then a couple verses down, verse 31, it says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Then a couple more verses down, he says, verse 34, he says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow. How many times does he say anxious? Don't be worried, don't be anxious, depending on what your version is. Some versions will say worry. So he keeps, Jesus is telling us the same thing. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And he uses these basics because these are the necess necessary things, food, clothing, and, and housing, and things like that. Those are the things that, that most of us just have to have. And so anxiety is characterized by self-centered thinking. It's also characterized by nervousness and doubt and fear. The Philippians had many trials which could cause them to worry. They could worry about the fate of the Apostle Paul. They were very connected to Paul, and, and you know, that could be a problem. They, they were worried about persecution. The, the church there went through a lot of persecution. They could be concerned and worried about that. They could be concerned about the sickness of Ephroditus, in chapter 2, verse 26, 27. They, they could be concerned about opposing false teachers that they had to deal with. We see in chapter 3, verse 2. They could be concerned about the vision within the church that they had to deal with in chapter 4. All kinds of things that if they wanted to, they could be concerned and worry about. But anxiety can rob believers of joy. Now what if this happened to you this morning? You're sitting in a pew and someone came and stole your purse. They opened your purse and took $50 out of your purse or came and stole your wallet, took $50, put the rest back. How would you be after they stole your money? You'd be a little upset, wouldn't you? Someone stole my money. I see them. They're running out that way. They're stealing my money. Someone stop John and Mag. Stop them. Trip them. Do something. And you'd talk about it, wouldn't you? Some people might even call the police and make a report. You better get the police down here. Someone stole my money. Some people might even say, I'm never going back to that church again. They have a thief there. He's stealing people's money. <coughs> but someone can take your joy and won't say well. Isn't that true? They can steal your joy. Right out there. <coughs> and many times we just open our hands and let them have it. Oh, joy, you got it. Don't take the fifty dollars in this hand. No, no, no. I take take everything back. See, anxiety can rob <coughs> us of our joy, and it leads to rumblings and disputings. Paul urges the Philippians to rid themselves of anxieties by relying on God, but in everything by what prayer and supplication. 
Let's, with thanksgiving, let's request be made known to God. New Living Translation brings out this contrast. New Living Translation says, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Brady puts it this way, the way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. A couple good thoughts on that. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, Paul says, Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To the end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. He would say in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 5, She who is truly a widow, left alone, has to set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers, how often? Night and day. <coughs> 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1, Paul says, First of all, then I urge that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Let your request be made known to God, continues the main thrust of this verse. And finally, in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31, 32, excuse me, for the Gentiles seek after these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. You know, before I start worrying or be concerned about something, God knows that it's something I may need. And I don't need it. I, I personally am careful what I pray for. I was watching someone on Facebook the other day, and they're an Uber driver. I never thought about being an Uber driver, but this person is a preacher. He doesn't make enough money as a preacher to, to pay his bills. And so he started driving Uber during the week. And then he puts this statement, pray for me because I haven't got any tips yet. So if you take Uber, tip your Uber driver, by the way. But it might be a preacher. But he, he I thought, is that something you pray for, tips? In my mind, it's not. But yet, God says what? Let your request be made known to God. If you want to pray for tips, I guess you can pray for tips. I would pray for your tips, I don't think. But God knows before I even pray. He wants to hear it from me, but he knows what I need. He knows every hair on our head. Hebrews 11, verse 6, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. We have to have faith that he's going to hear us. He's going to take our burdens away. He's going to take our worry away. He's going to give us joy and take all those anxieties away from us. The Hebrew writers say, without this faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This morning, if you're not yet a Christian, we encourage you to do that. If you need to study with us, we'd be glad to study with you. Just let us know. Or, or if you need prayers at church, we'll pray with you for you. Won't you come? So stand. And as we sing. Sweet are the promises God gives the word. Oh, oh.
lesson this morning. Uh, if, if there's no other announcements that need to be made, we'll have a prayer and be dismissed. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, my niece is back up in Oregon now and told them for three weeks. Okay. So, I want to lay one on to my kids for the radiation. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, remember uh, everyone who's uh, Mention today, uh, everyone's dealing with uh, different health issues and different things. Uh, we'll uh, have a prayer at this time and then be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you once again in prayer. Uh, again, Father, just thank you for this opportunity that we've had that you've uh, given us today to come and uh, hear a portion of your word. And uh, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, we'll take the uh, lessons that Elvis uh, presented to us today and uh, uh, we will uh, use the th these things to help uh, be better servants of yours. We pray, Father, we can uh, cast all our anxieties on you, Father, and all of our cares on you. And uh, uh, we pray, Father, that uh, you'd forgive each and every one of us for our sin against you. We pray for all those who are mentioned on the prayer list and all those who are struggling and having different issues at this time, you know everyone's needs, Father. We just pray that you would uh, help them as you see fit. Uh, we also like to pray, Father, for our nation at this time and the leadership of our nation and, and the people of our nation. We just pray, Father, that that you could uh, have mercy on us and and. Uh, Continue to bless us, Father. We just pray that the people of this nation and their leaders would turn to you and that we can, that you can help us do our part to help spread the uh, borders of your kingdom and to, and to do our part to uh, help this nation, Father. Uh, just give us the strength and the wisdom to, uh, to be serv better servants of yours, Father. And we pray all these things through your son Jesus' holy name. Amen.